Dr. Christine Jones is all the way from Australia. Over several decades, she's worked with innovative farmers and graziers to implement regenerative uh, land management practices to enhance biodiversity, nutrient cycling, carbon sequestration, productivity, water quality, and catchment health. So without any further ado, please give a big Irish welcome for Dr. Christine Jones. So we're talking about restoring biodiversity to agricultural soils and probably for the last 50 years or so, the way that we've thought about soil has been very much to look at it as an inert uh, substance that sits below our plants and sits below our animals. I've shown it there in a very simplistic way, but unfortunately we have got to think about soil in a very simplistic way. So if our plants aren't functioning as we'd like or our animals aren't functioning as we'd like, we tend to want to um, blame the soil for it really and, and, and try and fix the soil. So we'll take a sample and we'll send it off to the lab, expose that wonderful life that's in the soil to all kinds of chemicals that they've never been exposed to before and extract some numbers that are generally meaningless that will come back and say, you need to add nitrogen or you need to add phosphorus or you need to add something else to your soil to make your plants function better and your animals function better. And um, previous speakers this morning have talked about technology and unfortunately we have gone down that very much technological quick fix for our soil. Oh, it's lacking in this, this and this. So we'll add these things and theoretically that will make, make it better. But that isn't the way that soil functions and that's not the way that soil has functioned for millennia. Um, as I said, the microbes got here first and they had things pretty much sorted out well before humans came along. And we now know that Fertile humus rich topsoil, which is the kind of topsoil that's going to function effectively for us as farmers, and it's also obviously going to be pulling down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It is product. It didn't just get there. If we go somewhere in the world where there are no plants, where it's too hot, too cold, too dry, too something for plants to grow, in the polar regions where it's too cold, or on the top of a very high mountain where it's too cold, or out in the Sahara Desert or somewhere where it's too dry. If there are no plants, you won't find soil. You'll find weathered rock materials, but not topsoil. So in order for those weathered rock materials to be converted into soil, we actually need plants, we need exudates coming from plant roots, and we need the microbes to resynthesize those products that come out of plant roots and convert them to the um, for want of a better word, sticky substances that secrete soil particles together into aggregates because the aggregate is really the primary um, factor for soil function. So our triangle, in simplistic terms, actually looks like this. With photosynthesis at the base, then we have the roots and their associated microbes, and then soil is really a product of those factors. It's fairly obvious driving around this country and looking at green everywhere, that you have a certain amount of photosynthesis all the time. And you may well say, uh, well, photosynthesis is not an important factor here. And I'm Christine, look around you, look at all the green. But when you use a refractometer, uh, how many of you in the room put your hand up if you own a refractometer? And keep your hand up if you use it regularly. All right, so a refractometer is going to measure the bricks level of the sap of your plants, and that's the dissolved solids that are in the sap of those plants. Your roots level will tell you how fast your plants are photosynthesizing. We want a large proportion of the sap to actually be uh, dissolved solids. Things like sugars, minerals, trace elements, all those kinds of things will give you a high roots reading. If you put um, distilled water into a refractometer, it will measure zero. The scale on the refractometer goes up to 30. We have some organic farmers in Australia going off the scale with bricks readings. They will get up over 30. It's very unusual for anybody here in this country to get a reading as high as 20. Now, one thing is I must admit that it's not quite as warm and sunny here as it is in Australia. And obviously photosynthesis depends on how much sunshine you get. But even in places with less sunshine in Australia, such as New Zealand, we still have farmers getting greetings up in the 20s. So what I'm saying to you is that green 
is not necessarily good. It's better than brown, yes, and better than bare ground. But unless those plants are photosynthesizing at a high rate, they're not really fixing a lot of carbon and they're not really transferring a lot of carbon to their soil. What we need to look at is what sorts of things in your situation can we do to get plants to photosynthesize faster. And one of those main things is going to be looking at the soil microbiome because soil microbes uh, interact with plants to uh, stimulate plants to photosynthesize. It's a little bit like a cow with a calf. A cow that has a calf on her will produce more milk than a cow that doesn't have a calf on her. So the, uh, uh, if you think of the cow as being the host and the calf as being the microbes, depending on that host, she will produce more milk the more milk you take. So when we look at what happens in the soil microbiome, we see that if plants are producing a lot of exudates, there will be a lot of microbes around the roots, and you can tell there's a lot of microbes around the roots because they will stick soil particles together to form what we call a rhizo sheet. The rhizosphere is the area around a plant root. The rhizo sheet is when there are soil particles sticking around that plant root. And when there is a rhizo sheet around plant roots, we know that the plant is photosynthesizing at a very high rate. We know there's lots of exudates coming out of the roots, and we know that there's a lot of healthy microbes that are very, very beneficial for that plant living around the roots. One thing that those microbes do is obviously protect the roots from disease. Roots that have good riser sheets on them, it's almost impossible for pathogens such as root rot diseases and those kinds of things um, get even anywhere near the root so that there, there are a very protective um, area for disease or to protect plants from disease, I should say. But the other thing is if we look inside the riser sheet, so this is a this has been magnified 300 times, and again, something we can't see with the naked eye, is that on your left-hand side is the edge of the root, and then on the right-hand side, so this is the, the root here, and then we've got soil particles over here. So what we're looking at is actually the inside of a riser sheet under high magnification. The, uh, Strands, the hypae, these are the hypae of a whole range, probably hundreds of different kinds of fungi. Some of those will be things like mycorrhiza or trichoderma. Others will be saprotrophic fungi. In other words, they're just feeding on the sugars that come out of, out of the plant roots. And these fungi are very important for distributing. Um, there are something like a thousand different kinds of carbon compounds that come out of plant roots. And a lot of those are distributed out into the soil. It's like a uh, a bit like the internet, really, transferring information as well as transferring en an energy source. And there's a lot of communication goes on between plants and between microbes in the soil. What we can't see at this level of magnification are the trillions, basically, well, like, truly, there are trillions within a very small area of bacteria and archaea, which is smaller than the fungi. And so this is a biological hotspot in the soil. We need to look at um, farming in ways that actually create these riser sheets and create this kind of biological activity in the soil. So why, why are these important? Um, why are the microbes important? Well, because they are probably the most powerful force on this planet. And it is a force that we as humans can learn to manage uh, because microbes can do an incredible amount of work in the soil and microbes can do, perform many, many functions that we humans are incapable of. Um, and in fact, when it comes to feeding this plant, some of the energy is going in one direction uh, from the plant out into the soil microbiome and there's a lot of, <coughs> in exchange for that, there are a lot of nutrients going back the other way. So when we have a healthy, healthy riser sheet around plant roots or even just a healthy microbiome around plant roots, we have signaling going on between the plant and between the microbes. Microbes, remember, can't be there without a host plant, so it's feeding them. And the faster that plant photosynthesizes, the more food there's going to be for soil microbes. So the more the microbes look after that plant, the better it will be able to feed them. So the microbes... The microbial intelligence is all about getting just the right amount 
of nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, boron, zinc, copper, cobalt, molybdenum, and manganese, whatever it might be that the plant needs, it will send a message out on those networks for what it needs. It will stimulate the kinds of microbes that it needs to access the nutrients, and they will be transferred back on that fungal high point, on that fungal highway. So it's very, very important that we have a lot of beneficial fungi in our soils. The fungal to bacteria ratio is incredibly important. There has been a theory go around that the fungal to bacteria ratio in grassland soils, um, I probably, probably shouldn't call them grassland, I prefer to call them herblands because we need to actually have more broadleaf plants than grasses. And some of the best herblands that I have seen don't have any grasses in them. This, I'm talking about uh, for dairy now, um, or for beef or sheep. So for livestock production, we're better off not having any grasses in there. But um, <clears throat> that's another issue. Um, some of the best ones that I've seen have <clears throat> fungal to bacterial ratios around about 15 to 1. So certainly not 1 to 1. So it's unfortunate that that number comes from a basically a degraded situation that will be dominated by glass. So let's just very quickly now just have a look at these microbes. Like why is it that they're so important? Well, last year there was a census of life on Earth where scientists estimated what the actual biomass of living things were on this planet. And I'm not quite sure how they figured it out. I read the materials and methods and I still went, well, I'm glad it was them doing it, not me. But they figured out there's 550 gigatons of carbon-based life forms on Earth, uh, and 450 of that 550 gigatons is in the form of plants, which is not surprising because most places you go, there are plants, and they are the dominant living things in the landscape, the ground cover, um, <coughs> the shrubs, the trees. And all the other living things on this planet make up that remaining 100 gigatons. But where it got really interesting when I was reading this article was that the things we can't see, the protists, the archaea, the fungi, and the bacteria actually comprise 93% of that other 100 gigaton. So if we break it up like this, you see um, the orange section um, is the protists, the purple, the archaea, the green, the fungi, and the bacteria, um, the brown section on the bottom, make up a massive 70% of that remaining um, 100 gigatons. And things that we can see when we think about life on Earth, what well, we think about people, obviously, and we think about things we can see, the insects, um, you know, the fish in the water, um, things that we can eat, like, you know, oysters and mussels and shrimp and whatever. Annelids include things like earthworms and the nematodes, obviously our livestock, our domestic animals and our the wildlife, the birds, all those things that when we think about life on Earth, we think about all the things we can see they make up 7% of that 100 gigatons. In the overall picture, plants and their associated microbes make up 99% of the weight of life on Earth. And all of those things only make up 1%. And humans are only a very, very tiny part of that. In the final analysis, humans comprise on 0.01% of the biomass of life on Earth. So we've certainly punched above our weight when it comes to changing how ecosystems function on this planet. Um, we're a very tiny part of it. Um, we have contributed a large part to disrupting natural ecosystem function, but we are capable of turning that around and restoring function. And in order to restore that function, we need to look at microbes, basically, because they are running this planet. And the more we investigate that, the more we realise how powerful they are. Uh, in the human sense, we have something like 10 trillion bacterial cells in our bodies that actually constitute, we are, um, we have about 1 trillion cells ourselves. I don't get that wrong. We have 10 trillion cells and there's 100 trillion bacterial cells, something like that. We're about 10% human anyway on a, on a cell count. Um, so the microbes, our gut microbiome is very important. And the more you read about human health, the more you'll realise that nearly all of our autoimmune disorders that people suffer from today are in fact related to the gut microbiome and most can be reversed with a faecal transplant. Um, so, for example, um, autistic kids have certain key bacteria totally missing from the gut. 
they just every single autistic child does not have those bacteria there. That it's a function of the gut microbiome that is affecting the function of the brain. And it is exactly the same kind of thing with soils. If we're talking about our agricultural soils and the way they've been treated um, and all the chemicals that we've used in the last 50 years, we have hugely simplified the soil microbiome and some key functional groups of uh, bacteria and archaea, protists, fungi are missing. And in order to get function back into agricultural landscapes, we have to figure out how to get those microbes back. The easiest way is with multi-species plantings because every kind of plant supports a different kind of microbiome. So we are restoring function. What you're actually seeing is restoring function by restoring diversity above ground. So these numbers that I'm talking about are actually in terms of weight. When we're looking at bigger like that, we're talking about the weight of microbes, not the number of them. Um, the numbers are more, uh, absolutely mind-blowing. So one teaspoon of healthy soil. I know people say this a lot, but it's really hard to get your mind around. One teaspoon of healthy soil, if it's like taken from around the roots of, a, of an actively growing plant, contains more microbes than all the humans there are on Earth. And then when we look at this other <coughs> environments that are even more microbially rich, obviously the rumen is one of those. The rumen of a cow or a sheep or a goat, it's a fermentation vat that is absolutely uh, alive with microbes involved in breaking down the forages that the animals consume. One tiny drop of rumen fluid contains more 10,000 times more microbes than there are humans on the planet. It's really, really hard to get your head around those kinds of numbers. The take home message from that is that all plants and animals, including us, are embedded in a microbial world and we have a microbial world embedded within us and there is a microbial world embedded within our plants and within our animals. Those of us who are livestock producers understand the importance of the rumen and how that functions. But we have overlooked the importance of what actually goes on inside a plant and in the soil surrounding the plant. So we have to start thinking of that <coughs> as a whole biome. There are no barriers, even though we see the, the membrane around a root, for example, and we think, oh, this is the plant root and then this is the soil. In a healthy system, it's all just a continuum. There are microbes moving from the soil into the plant all of the time. There are microbes moving from the plant out into the soil all of the time. The plant is the gatekeeper. The plant decides who it invites to the party. Not all microbes can easily move into plants, but a lot, a lot of microbes are invited to move into plants because the plant will send out signals for those microbes come and live in the plant for the entire life of the plant sometimes, other times they just circulate around, moving in, moving out. Um, and similarly with nutrients, there's, there's a lot of material comes out of plant roots into the soil as a lot of material goes from the soil into plant roots. We don't have to sit down and work out how much nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, um, you know, boron, zinc, whatever this plant needs. The plant knows. Plants have been around for millions of years. They know what they need. The microbes know how to get those things. The microbes know how to look after the plant because the plant is its host. It's all about photosynthesis and feeding the soil. Now we come along with our livestock and we want our livestock to be healthy. We want our livestock to be well fed. We want to make a profit out of farming. Well, if we want to do all those things, we need to understand how that microbiome functions, even if it's only in very simplistic terms. The detail is mind-blowing and probably we will never fully understand it. But if we understand the basic principle of diversity, we know that even in a group of people, it's good to have a diversity of ideas. We know that if people are, they need to be of a like mind, obviously, to work together, but if you have a group of people of a like mind with a common purpose and the passion to get something done, that they are able to accomplish usually what one person on their own is not able to accomplish. So similarly in the soil, if we have different kinds of microbes, different functional groups of microbes actually working together collaboratively 
because it is in the interest of the microbes to look after the plants. The microbes benefit, but we can make that of a benefit for the human population as well, because when the microbes are looking after the plants, the plants grow better, they're more resistant to, uh, to uh, stresses such as drought, such as frost, they produce more biomass, they more, produce more nutrient-dense feed, so our animals actually need to consume less in order to make the same kind of weight gains um, to produce uh, dairy cows will produce more milk, they'll have higher fertility, they'll have less um, metabolic issues such as laminitis and mastitis and all those kinds of things. Nearly all the issues that we see in farming today can be related back to a dysfunction in the soil microbiome. So we have to figure out how to, to get that to work again. So when we stand on soil, we're standing on the rooftop of another world. So in our multi-species pastures, we see that uh, a multi-species sward always produces more biomass than a sward that's comprised of one single species within that mix. So if you just took one thing like ryegrass, for example, that one in the middle, um, and just have a field of ryegrass, that will never produce as much biomass as this multi-species mix. Now, the reason that that has been attributed in the past has been to what's called niche complementarity. In other words, plants have different root architecture. Some have deep tap roots, some have shallow fibrous roots. And the fact that they occupy different parts of the soil uh, has been well, you know, they're feeding in different areas and so you can fit a whole lot more plants in and uh, therefore you get greater production. But what we now know is that those plants are all joined together underground with what's called a common mycorrhizal network. So the mycorrhizal fungi that have formed a relationship with those plants, in fact, they have been invited by the plant to form a relationship. When a seed germinates, it will send out special signals to stimulate the germination of spores of mycorrhiza in the soil. They will follow the concentration gradient of that signal towards the plant root so that they know where it is. So if the, the mycorrhizal spore germinates and grows in the wrong direction, it's going to run out of energy before it finds the plant root. So it follows uh, a hormone concentration gradient. That hormone is called strigolactone. When it forms a relationship with that plant, it will then link up with the other plants and form a common mycorrhizal network. Now, some plants are, um, will support different microbes than others, and when they all work together collectively, you can produce far more biomass and much more nutrient-dense biomass by having um, all these plants growing together. It's very important that you don't use high analysis fertilisers. Don't use uh, inorganic nitrogen. Don't use water-soluble phosphorus because it interrupt, both of those uh, chemicals interact or they disrupt the signalling between plants and microbes and you won't have your common mycorrhizal network there. You'll still have your different plant species but you miss out on the power of the microbes, which is far more powerful than the power of the fertilisers. So of all of the microbes that are important to soil building, our mycorrhizal fungi really are king. I mean, in this diagram, you can see the top part of the plants and the black part is the roots, and then all the yellow strands, it looks like spaghetti, they're the fungi, uh, the fungal hyphae of mycorrhiza, and they extend the um, absorptive quality, if you like, of roots. They can extend the mass of roots up to, to 1,000 fold. So there's more opportunity for the plant to extract nutrients and water from the soil. But what's more important than that is the ability of the mycorrhiza to uh, respond to signals from the plant and bring back exactly what it is that the plant needs. So if we look at a cross section of a plant root, um, you see those little things in there that look like little trees or broccoli plants or the lung of an animal. These are the exchange sites. So they're called arbuscular mycorrhiza. Um, they're the kind of mycorrhiza that live in our forage plants. This is a close-up view of, of the arbuscle of a mycorrhizal fungi. So it is an exchange site just like the lung in an animal. We have carbon growing from plant tissue into that arbuscle, and that carbon is in the form of sugars. It's converted to lipids and it's, trans, uh, it's translocated within the mycorrhizal network in the form of lipids, but that's probably a detail that you don't need to know. What we see going in the other direction 
is that the arbuscle is putting into that plant cell all the nutrients that that plant needs. So in exchange for the sugars, the mycorrhiza is feeding the plant. So provided when we take cross sections of the roots, we see that they're well colonised with mycorrhiza fungi, we know that they're getting everything that they need. And these fungal hyphae here that run through this plant cell, there is what we call bidirectional flow taking place in there. So we have carbon coming from here into the arbuscle and into the hyphae and moving out into the soil. And at the same time, we have nutrients moving from the soil through the arbuscle and up out into the plant cell. If we fertilise the plant, fertilise in inverted commas, with something like inorganic nitrogen or inorganic phosphorus, water soluble phosphorus, the plant no longer needs to support the microbes in the soil that can fix nitrogen for free. It no longer needs to support the microbes in the soil that solubilise phosphorus. So it no longer needs to photosynthesise at a higher rate and uh, channel that carbon down to support the soil microbiome. So it will close those arbuscles. You can actually see that under the microscope, the plant just shuts those down. So by supplying those things, so-called fertilisers, we are interfering hugely with the communication between plants and the soil microbiome. Because when those arbuscles shut down and carbon stops being transferred to the soil, then the entire soil ecosystem that is comprised of a whole range of bacteria and archaea that are able to fix nitrogen um, and obtain all the trace elements and minerals that plants need are no longer being fed. So we take away the job of the microbes and we have to do it ourselves. So one of the very important things about um, having this relationship between plants and microbes functioning effectively is that carbon is also being transferred out into the soil. So what you see there in that photograph is uh, a mycorrhizal hyphae leading the plant root and actually moving out into the soil microbiome. And in this photograph here, you can see a plant root tip here. So this is the plant, and these, it looks a bit like a, um, a bottle washer or something, doesn't it? All these hyphae, um, this is a photograph taken in a laboratory, but those fungal hyphae, you can see how they, we can't see them. We can't see them with the naked eye, but you can see how they extend the surface area of that plant and how they're able to forage, but also how they really are like the internet of the soil. And when we have good levels of colonisation of fungi like that, that's when we see these amazing larger sheets on plants. This little wheat seed here hasn't even produced any leaves yet. It's got three seminal roots and it's got fantastic larger sheets. That seed didn't have any fertiliser put anywhere near it, but it had uh, a vermin liquid placed on the seed, like a worm juice, a compost extract will do the same sort of thing, or there's a whole range of biostimulants that will do the same kind of thing. They'll actually facilitate the signalling from the seed to the soil microbiome and get a very early relationship between roots and the surrounding microbes, which will enable that plant to obtain all of the nutrients that it needs. When that plant's a little bit older, in this photograph here, actually has some leaves now. You can see it's actually actively building soil. And as well as actively building soil, it is obtaining, um, it is producing nutrient rich leaves, which are going to be good for livestock production. So that's a close up of what's happening around the roots of the soil, uh, around the roots of the plant. And if we compare that with the one on this side, on the on your left hand side, is just across the fence. Um, that's an oak crop that has received urea, in this case, a nitrogen fertiliser was put under the seed. If you can see the roots, then they're not performing the functions that we want roots to perform. And on the right hand side um, is how it should look. You should not actually be able to see the roots themselves. This is a very well used, not, it's not my photograph, and it, you'll probably see this one used hundreds of times, because it gives a really great example. These are ectomycorrhizal fungi on a pine seedling, these ones we can see. Um, this photograph's taken in laboratory, so we have a little pine seedling here. Pine seedling roots are just here right in the centre, and all of this uh, white cobwebby material around the outside is the mycelium of 
Hector Michaelides of fungus in this case. These are the kinds of fungi that form a relationship with trees and they are visible to the human eye. But the reason I like this photograph is because it will be the same for the endomycorrhizal fungi that we can't see. And what's happening is that the plant's photosynthesizing, it's supporting this uh, web of light, if you like, around its roots. And then at the margins of those mycelium will be colonies of bacteria that are able, bacteria are absolutely extraordinary. They can obtain all the minerals, all the trace elements that plants need but they require energy to do it. And the energy is going to come from the sun, it's going to be captured by the plant during photosynthesis, light energy is going to be transformed to biochemical energy, channeled down into the soil through the roots and then out through this mycorrhizal highway, if you like, to feed those colonies of bacteria that can be quite a long distance from the plant root. Now, when you think about it, plants can be very long lived. Trees, you're all well aware of the fact that trees can live for hundreds of years. In our Australian environment, our perennial grasses, our native perennial grasses, um, can live for hundreds of years as well. So a plant is stuck in the one place for a very long time. It needs to have a relationship with microbes around its roots in order to feed itself, because otherwise it's going to run out of nutrients that are just located very close to the roots I mean, how can a tree live for hundreds of years and keep feeding itself on the same piece of soil unless it has a mycorrhizal network around it to bring nutrients from other places and also to transfer nutrients between plants? So this is a close-up of that same photograph. You can see the root is just running down there through the centre and all the white cobwebby stuff that you see around it is fungal mycelium. So just imagine that root without the fungal mycelium there. Well, if you imagine that root without the fungal mycelium, that's what roots look like when you use synthetic fertilisers because you wipe those fungi out, those beneficial fungi. Now, the other thing about uh, fungi, fungal mycelium is that it will connect plants. So here we have three little pine seedlings and they're all connected by what we call um, the mycorrhizal highway or the common mycorrhizal network. If you Google common mycorrhizal networks, you'll find lots of scientific research that's been done on this subject. Unfortunately, most of the science is related to just looking at two plants, two different kinds of plants, because once we start talking about plant diversity, the kind of diversity I'd like to see, where we have, say, at least 20 different kinds of plants in a pasture, then it becomes very complicated looking at the networks between them. Um, but some of the research that's been done, um, this one is showing you the grass, it's actually sorghum, and the broadleaf plant is flax or linseed. Um, sorghum doesn't grow in Ireland or not very well anyways, but this is an American example. But all they're showing here is that the green arrow going down is carbon inputs into the soil and the yellow arrows going up are uh, the uptake of phosphorus and nitrogen. In this situation, there is no phosphorus or nitrogen being added. It's just showing how uh, plants interact in order to be able to stimulate the common mycorrhizal network, which is the little blue the little blue lines shown here. So we've got plants and their roots and then we've got the common mycorrhizal network. It's just a study looking into the common mycorrhizal network. But in this example, what they found is that if they grew flax on its own or linseed on its own, different countries have different names but it's the same plant, or sorghum on its own, they looked to see how much biomass that produced and then they put them together. And what they found was that when they put them together, the flax actually grew 300% more or three times more um, and the sorghum grew slightly more. So there's lots and lots of situations now where people are looking at combining different kinds of plants to increase the growth simply through the common mycorrhizal network. So things like flax and chickpeas, um, there's lots and lots of combinations being tried. Uh, Faba beans and maize also work extremely well. So just to give you an example of something visual that you can see, um, this was from a research station in, um, in Ontario, in Canada. Um, I've tried to give you Canadian examples today to, to try and get something that's similar to the latitude here. So this is not quite as far north as here, but it's around 50 degrees or something, so it's not far off it. Um, radish is a brassica, and brassicas don't form mycorrhizal networks when they're grown as a monoculture, but they do participate in mycorrhizal networks when they're in a mixture. So it's fine to put brassicas in your mix. 
um, that don't grow up a monoculture of a, of a brassica. So a brassica might be something like rape or mustard, oilseed radish, tillage radish, any of those things, um, please don't grow them as monocultures. And this one is showing all these signs of nitrogen deficiency, even though the, the uh, fields were fertilised. So what we're looking at here is uh, strips of different cover crops, probably about the same width as this room. You can see that there's another, um, that's probably corn there in the background, and then there's a line here and a line here. So there was a research farm looking at a whole lot of things that could be grown as covers, as monocrops, and then looking at them as polycrops. So they looked at three-way, five-way, seven-way, nine-way, 11-way mixes of all these different things. So here we just have radish grown on its own, and right next to it, on the right-hand side, was a very simple mix that just had radish. Um, I'll try and, so the, this is the radish, you can see it's completely different colour, it's not showing nitrogen deficiency. I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a sunflower in there, there's some oats here, and there's the celia here. So a very simple mix of radish plus oats, the celia and sunflower, and there is no nitrogen deficiency in the radish when it's sown in that multi-species mix. It also grew a lot more vigorously. So to give you an example of how this soil microbiome works, I love this one um, that's talked about a lot with the trees. Again, this is a Canadian example. And they talk about how altruistic trees are when you have different species of trees growing together. So this is an example of paper birch here and Douglas fir here. So what happens in winter time when the paper birch loses its leaves is that you can use radio labelled or uh, radioactively labelled carbon and see that carbon from the Douglas fir tree is actually channeled to the silver birch, uh, sorry, to the paper birch to keep it alive during winter time when it doesn't have any leaves. And then in summertime when the paper birch has lots of leaves and it's actually causing a shadow to the seedlings of the Douglas fir the paper birch tree channels carbon to the seedlings of the Douglas fir to keep them alive in the summertime. And the people, the researchers who've been studying this stuff, isn't this amazing how socially responsible these trees are and they look after each other and keep the diversity going? Well, it has really nothing to do with the trees. We have to look at, well, who's directing the traffic here? The common mycorrhizal network benefits by having some plants keep photosynthesize fast in the summertime and other ones that can photosynthesize during the winter. So it's actually the intelligence of the microbial network that says, hey, in wintertime when this guy's not photosynthesizing, let's keep him alive. And then in summertime when these seedlings need some energy, let's channel some around. So the mycorrhiza are actually deciding where that carbon goes and who to keep. Because when you think of it from the benefit of the, of the common mycorrhizal network is to have diversity there. And it is exactly the same in your multi-species pasture mix. The mycorrhizal network benefits from having lots of plants there because all those different plants that you put in your mix are going to have different strengths and weaknesses when it comes to when they photosynthesize, what their leaf area is, how much carbon they channel to the soil, and also what kind of microbes they support. So think about it as diversity is to keep, is to maintain a diverse soil microbiome. So those microbes in our soil, they can't speak, they can't see anything, they can't hear anything. It's absolutely extraordinary how they do communicate with each other um, and how well organised they are. And that's actually a really good thing. They do collaborate. So collaboration is not a unique thing to the human species. Um, and they're probably better at collaborating than we are. Um, and fortunately, their collaboration results in all sorts of extraordinary outcomes that we see in agriculture. So this is from a, an article that was entitled Chemical Signaling in the Plant Microbe Interactions. There's lots and lots of research in this area now. But what we're seeing here is our plant. Um, there will be signaling going on above ground. This is a leaf, it's called a phyllo, and the phyllosphere is the area on a plant leaf. It is just as important as the rhizosphere, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So the rhizosphere is the area around the plant roots. We have lots and lots of different exudates coming out. Um, some of those things are nutrients, and some of them are actually chemical signaling molecules. What we want to do is attract all these beneficial microbes. 
We want to send signals out to the good guys. We want the good guys then to protect the plant roots and repel the bad guys. So just imagine when we interfere with that. We interfere with that hugely if we plant a seed that has insecticide and fungicide on it. We think we're doing a great job. We think we're protecting the seed with all those chemicals that we apply. But in actual fact, we've just wiped out the soil microbiome and now the plant is actually far more vulnerable to being attacked than it otherwise would be. What we needed to do, what, what, have been, what would have been better, would have been to put a biostimulant on that seed that actually stimulated microbes in the soil so we get large numbers of them that are going to protect our plant. Whoops. Well, that was interesting. That was, that was obviously something you need to take note of. So here is another view of just how it looks in the world of a plant. Plant, we think, oh, it's just a green plant, they're stuck in the soil. We don't realise that there's all this talk, all this signalling going on, that the plant is noticing, plants know what other kinds of plants, or they sense what other kinds of plants are going near them, and also there's a lot of signalling going on in the soil. It's probably a little bit like in this room at the moment, there are lots of signals we can't see, but if you've got a, um, you know, a mobile phone, it can pick up signals. If we had a television receiver, it's going to pick up signals. The air in here is absolutely full of signals. That if we have some kind of an antenna or some kind of a device that can pick those signals up, then we can, they can be um, collected and translated. <laughs> the plant is like an antenna. It is picking up signals all the time from other plants, from microbes around it, and especially uh, around the roots. The, the chemical signaling that's going on in the soil is absolutely extraordinary. So what we find when we look into this a little bit further is that if you do a total nutrient test on your soil, in other words, use something that a geologist would use, like X-ray diffraction, for example, to look to see what are all the minerals that are in my soil, you'll find that it's very, very rare for your soil to be lacking in something. Um, a soil test is only going to tell you what's water-soluble or what's soluble in acid. It's not going to tell you what microbes are able to extract from your soil. So more of the deficiencies that will show up on the soil test are due to poor soil structure, uh, and I've seen plenty of that um, in my two weeks here, and lack of microbial activity. So when we use toxic chemicals and high analysis fertilisers, um, we throw those microbial populations way out of sync and we are actually impairing the soil function, even though we think we're doing it for the right reasons. Um, I haven't talked about this this morning and I'm not going to, because um, I don't have time, but the excessive use of nitrogen and phosphorus fertilisers has caused, has caused soil degradation. People don't realise how degrading those chemicals can be, and we're all aware of the environmental pollution, which is the one we hear all about. Um, and the reason that it causes degradation in the soil is that it reduces diversity. Um, and then that leads to trace element deficiencies in plants, animals and people. So just to give you an example, now you'll be told, oh, you have to add nitrogen because it makes plants grow. And yes, if you're using a rising plate meter or something like that, when you add nitrogen plants to, you know, let's say take a ryegrass example, add any, the ryegrass will grow more, but it's just empty leaves. That extra of what you think is biomass does not uh, follow through to milk production. And if somebody can show me an example from the Irish, well, Irish, don't have to be Irish, any scientific literature that relates amount of nitrogen applied to milk production, I'd be very happy to see it because what you will find is the amount of nitrogen applied related to biomass of grass. And in that case, uh, so just to give you the Australian example, um, this is from our Dairy Research Institute and this paper was put together by two professors who said, who analysed milk production um, over this period from 1991 to 2003 and they found there was no relationship. In Australia, they looked at this very carefully. Um, so the black line is how much nitrogen was used by Australian dairy farmers and the red line was milk production over that same period. The only reason that milk production increased slightly over that time was due to improved genetics of the dairy cows. Nothing at all to do with nitrogen. There is no relationship between those two lines. So why do we think we have to apply 
nitrogen in order to increase production. And that's just to give you one example. The scenario for grains and vegetables is similar, but this lack of nutrient density, the empty calories, in other words, goes largely unnoticed until we look at you know, human health. Um, because we see that the reduced plant uptake of minerals and trace elements does have negative flow on effects for animal and human health. Look at what's being fed in dairies now. Look at the meal that's being fed when animals come in to be milked. We're trying to make up for those deficiencies that are in the feed by giving them minerals and other things in their feed. Go into a big supermarket, you'll see there's a whole aisle devoted now to, uh, to supplements for people, vitamins and minerals and things. If we were getting all those elements in our food, we wouldn't need those supplements. And then for the plants themselves, uh, mineral depletion, the plants are increasingly, increasingly susceptible to pests and diseases. Then the farmer is put into the situation of having to apply insecticides and fungicides. That reduces profits and then adds unnecessary chemicals to the food chain. And when we're looking at the profitability, I'm sure the situation will be very similar in Ireland as it is in Canada and other parts of the world. And this shows net Canadian farm income from 1926 through to 2016. In that 80 year period, there in the initial, initial stages in the early uh, 20s and 30s, we see that this is gross farm income or gross agricultural. This is the gross value of agricultural production over time, the blue area. The green area is net farm income. So in the early part of the 1900s, net farm income and gross farm production followed a very similar trend. So if there was low commodity prices or if there was poor seasons and then gross value of production went down, then farmers' incomes went down. When gross value of production went up, farmers' incomes went up. And that's what we'd like to see. We'd like to see those two lines following the same same trend. But then round about here, we see that the gross value of agricultural production continued to increase and the net farm income went down. In 2006, that red area there was when uh, the cost of producing corn was greater than the revenue that farmers received for corn and yet they continued to grow it, which is interesting. But we've seen the same thing recently in Australia and New Zealand with a downturn in dairy prices that people have made, continued to produce milk even though it's costing something like on average around $200,000 a year to produce that milk, they've continued on. Um, so the change is not something that's easy. But in that graph, if you look at this great big blue area here, this is the cost of inputs. Input providers are doing very well, thank you very much. So Darren Coleman, who put this information together and last year he published a book on this. But in this last 32 year period, well from 1985 to 2016, input suppliers received 1.32 trillion of the 1.35 trillion of agricultural production. In other words, 98% went to input providers. So some sectors in the agricultural industry are doing very well, thank you very much, but it's not the farmers. So farm debt in Canada is at a record high, and I'm sure farm debt in Ireland is also at a record high. And farmers are told they have to produce more to get out of this mess. It's not actually about maximising yield, it's about optimising profit, and we have to regenerate the resource base. So we need to talk about supporting micros rather than using high analysis fertiliser because the use of high analysis fertiliser is actually the thing that gets us on that treadmill of then needing the insecticides and the pesticides and the vet every other day because of our animal health issues. We have to realise those linkages. It's not just about environmental pollution. It's about what is happening on your farm. So the options that you have rather than using a high analysis fertiliser, I can use a biostimulant in place, or use plant diversity. Plant diversity will replace fertiliser every time, provided you have sufficient diversity, or preferably a biostimulant and plant diversity, put the two things together. So what is a biostimulant? It's something that supports the soil microbiome. It's not something that attempts to replace fertilisers. It's not just a black coated urea or a soft rock phosphate or some fiddling around the edges of, oh, we're still going to use nitrogen, but we're going to use it in a more sustainable way, or we're still going to use phosphorus, but we're going to use it in a, a more responsible way. You don't need to add any form of nitrogen to your soil. You don't need to add any form of phosphorus to your soil. A biostimulant will take you a long way. It won't take you as far as plant diversity, 
but it has taken me a long way. And it's most effective when conventional fertilizers are reduced. So just to give you one example uh, of use of a biostimulant, again, to try and get it in a, a latitude that's similar to yours, this is uh, Canada, Saskatchewan. Uh, this is Derek Axton, Axton Farms. If you Google him, you'll find a lot of information about Derek. He's into polycrops now and grows a lot of things together. Two-way, three-way, four-way mixes, plants them together, harvests them together and separates the seed. But this is just, in this case, um, some of his monocrops. This is just where he's used a biostimulant. This is durum wheat, and the, there's the wheat seed there. This is a very, very small seedling. It only has about three leaves, um, but already it has this very impressive root system going down from the seed quite deep down into the soil, and all of the roots have riser sheaths. So he's building the deep soil. The roots coming from the crown have amazing riser sheaths. If you were to look at roots grown with a conventional fertiliser in that same soil at the same time, they would probably be about this deep. They wouldn't have gone any further from that and they would be clean. They wouldn't have all that soil sticking to them. So this is an oak crop on Derek's farm that's more advanced. And again, you see beautiful riser sheets on these plants. You see his oak growing in the background there. Here's another example from Manitoba. This one, Gerald Weed, he uses diversity. Uh, he has replaced fertilizer with plant diversity. So he's got a mix, all these different things that I've just detailed there. And that's in the very early stages of growth when we pull the plants out. Again, we see riser sheets. So we've got clover beans, oats, chicken, birch, barley, all with riser sheets on them. So let's just talk about the extraordinary power of diversity. A simplified system is going to be a dysfunctional system and it doesn't matter whether it's the human gut, the animal gut or the soil. Anything that relies on microbial activity, we need it to be diverse rather than simple. So many current human health issues have been linked to a failure to support a diversity of microbes in the gut. We've thought about all kinds of things like reducing antibiotic use and uh, eating organically grown food that doesn't have chemicals on it, but we've really overlooked the diversity. The American Gut Project, which just came to a conclusion recently, involved 11,000 uh, American citizens, so it's a pretty robust trial as far as human health goes. Most human health trials are very expensive to run, and so they, as a general rule, like even having you know, 100 people involved in the trial would be a large number. So this is 11,000 people and everyone had to pay to contribute. So you paid $98, you received a kit in the mail and it outlined um, everything that you had to do to participate in the project. You had to keep a, a food diary every day, every day for seven days. You had to write down everything that you ate and how you felt, what your energy was like, what your mood was like, um, how, um, and also whether you were suffering from anything like headaches or um, pain in the joints or, or any of those kinds of things or whether you had any kind of an illness, you had to know all of that. And then at the end of the second days, you collected a fecal sample, put it in a special container and sent it off in the mail. It went to the laboratory at the university and it was analysed to see what was in your gut microbiome and you received that information back so you could see, for your $98, you could see what microbes you had in your gut. But what they found when they put all that information together from all 11,000 people was that those who consumed 30 different kinds of plant foods in a week were far more healthier and had more diverse gut microbiomes than people who consumed 10 or less different kinds of plant foods. And it didn't matter whether they were organic or not, or whether they were vegetarian or not uh, vegan. You know, it, in other words, it didn't matter how much meat you ate. What it did matter was how many different kinds of plant foods you ate. And in order to get up to 30 different kinds of plant foods in a week, you have to start looking at things like putting herbs in there, um, things like parsley and coriander and those kinds of things. Uh, and if you look at you know, French provincial cooking, or perhaps I'm not even sure what the situation was with um, Irish traditional kind of cooking, whether there was a lot of herbs went into those um, dishes. Or maybe it was just potatoes. <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, it's interesting in the United States, if you go into a restaurant and ask what kinds of vegetables do you have tonight, 
I said, oh yes, we've got lots of different vegetables tonight. You can have baked, steamed, fried, jacket, you know, fries, whatever. So they're actually talking about 10 different ways that you can cook potatoes. And I think the word vegetables and potatoes, it's synonymous, they're interchangeable in the United States. It's very, very hard to get a lot of different kinds of vegetables there. So I can understand why they do have so many issues. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome seems to affect almost everybody in the United States. But the other thing that they did note from this trial was that if you do eat meat, it's very important that it be not from a confined animal feeding operation. Because if the animals receive antibiotics routinely, that antibiotic is in the tissue of the animals and the, the microbiomes of people who ate meat from CAFOs, as they call them in the States, um, grain-finished, in other words, grain-finished meats, had the same gut profile as people who were on a course of antibiotics. So you're really going to reduce the diversity in your gut microbiome um, by eating CAFO meats. You need to get your grass-fed or grass-finished pasture um, beef, poultry, lamb, whatever. Very important point. So now if we're looking at animal health, it would be great also if those if the meat that you did eat came from animals who had consumed a diet that was rich in secondary player compounds. Fred Provenza, Pro Professor Fred Provenza from the United States, has written hundreds of articles about plant about um, nutrient um, ruminant health. And in fact last year he published a book called Nutrition which is an excellent book to read, even if you don't have ruminant animals, just to understand about the functioning of the rumen and how important that is for humans consuming meat. Um, but he found that diets rich in secondary plant compounds, what are they? They're things like bioflavonoids, carotenoids, polyphenols, anthocyanins, antioxidants, all those things with big names that you won't find in ryegrass, uh, increase microbial diversity in the gut, and that improves the animal's ability to digest uh, its forage intake. So when the animal is able to better digest the forage that it takes in, you're going to have a higher feed conversion efficiency. So if you do grow a multi-species sport for your animals, you'll find that they require less intake because uh, it's more nutrient dense and also because their feed conversion efficiency is higher. It means that you're also going to have a healthier animal um, and probably over time you'll find that you can have a higher stocking rate on your pastures simply because you need less for each animal. And it improves the immune, immune function so that they'll be subject to less metabolic diseases. So we find the same thing as what we're seeing in humans and what we're seeing in animals is the same in plants. That plants will uh, have less susceptibility to pests and diseases um, if they have a diverse microbiome around their roots. But many of our agricultural landscapes have become so simplified that we're not even aware of how incredibly productive a more diverse system can be. And that certainly is something I have noticed in the two weeks in Ireland driving around uh, is mostly I'm seeing ryegrass. Ryegrass, 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 yes it's green, but really it's not healthy. It's not healthy for the soil, it's not healthy for the animals and it's not healthy for the people consuming the milk or the meat from those animals to have such a simplified ecosystem because it is dysfunctional. And you see that now when you're looking at soil. So how do we apply this diversity principle to soils? It's not enough to have green plants because diversity really matters. I'm not really sure what kind of diversity you would have had here originally in Ireland uh, all I can say is that in our natural grasslands, such as in Australia or when we look at the American prairies, that we had at least 500 different kind of ground cover plants growing in those. I have seen meadows in England that had 200, at least 200 species in them, but I don't see why a meadow here couldn't have that number. But when you realise, even if it was 100, that having one thing or two things is nothing near like what it needs to be. And in those natural, um, natural grassland ecosystems, we see a huge diversity in the type of plant, the time of year that it grows, the root system that it has, and the microbiomes that must have been under those original grasslands uh, was certainly extraordinary, although we didn't realise it at the time. And when uh, some of those lands were first colonised by Europeans, the production was absolutely extraordinary. 
When we go back to paddock records that were made in Australia in the 1800s, there is no way that we can carry that many livestock per acre now on that same land um, because of the um, dysfunctional soil microbiome that now exists. Okay, we can't go back to having 100, 200, 700. I was involved in a survey just recently in the United States. We found 580 different ground cover plants on one ranch. So it's just mind boggling when you think of what the natural diversity could be. But we can get somewhere near it with a mix like, oh, like this. So we have, you know, plantain, red clover, chicory, peas, ryegrass, loose, and um, that's got beets in it. I do all this. This is from the Coal Masters um, from New Zealand, and fescue, dandelion, and coxwood. It's just to show you a range of different plants and a range of different root structures, and we have to remember about the microbiome that's going to be underneath that. So diverse plant communities supported with its soil microbiome, and it's that diversity in the soil that we're looking for. The question is, how many different kinds of plants do we have to have growing together to get the sorts of responses that we like? At the moment, we have ryegrass and clover mostly, um, sometimes coxfoot, uh, sometimes a bit of a few different kinds of clover. There might be red clover and white clover. I've seen some bursin and other kinds of clovers, but you know, what, what kind of, what's the minimum? And that's an answer that we don't really have but we certainly know that the soil microbiome does respond differently once we've crossed a threshold. And I'm not sure whether that's a number threshold or whether there's a certain number of different kinds of functional groups. In other words, different plant families that have different functions and maybe we can figure out um, you know, how we can achieve this easily. And we don't, obviously don't want to spend a lot of money doing it either. Um, just to give you some examples of this idea of a threshold, um, the Burley County Soil Conservation District, so this is in North Dakota, and there was a group of people from North Dakota, including Gabe Brown, who some of you may be familiar with, and Joe Fura, who runs, was part of this Soil Conservation District group. They went to a note on the Plains Conference in Kansas in 2006, and the keynote speaker that year was Adamir Caligari. And Adam here said, well, you, do, you guys are doing a great job with the cover crops. And putting in all these um, cover crops between cash crops were becoming very popular, but they were all monocrops. They were putting in things like all seed radish and cowpeas and lupins and whatever, just as a monocrop after a monocrop, monocrop cash crop. And he said, you're not going to see any huge improvements in your soil health until you have multi-species covers. So they went back and trialled that to see whether what he was saying is true, because um, he was down there in Brazil, and what would he know about North Dakota? Uh, so they had these individual one-acre plots of the cover crops that they most commonly used, oil seed radish, purple crop turnip, uh, pasture turnip, <laughs> turnip, soybean, cowpea, lupin, red clover, tongue, and rye grass. And then they put those together in a whole lot of mixes. Two-way, three-way, they went all the way up to having a six-way mix. And after they went to all that trouble to lay the whole thing out, uh, they only got 25 mils of rain, or say an inch of rain, between seeding in late May and harvest in late July. Which you would think, well, this is very disappointing. We went to all this trouble and then it didn't rain. And in fact, what they found was quite revealing because their monocrops, everything that they planted as an individual species, basically failed. So that's just to show you what the oil seed radish looked like on the 31st of July. For some strange reason, when Americans are measuring the dry matter of a pasture, they use a circle. I don't know why, but they've figured out, you know, something about what the circumference and what the area inside it is. And I mean, we use a we use a quadrant which is a square, a 50 by 50 by 50 centimetre quadrant, and you can very easily work out what that is then per hectare. But I guess their acres and their bushels and their, you know, like it's, when people start telling me that they had 200 bushel corn, I'm just thinking, what on earth is that in tons per hectare? So it's very hard to figure out if you're used to thinking in metrics how this imperial system works. But I'm, I notice people saying acres and miles and inches here, so I figure. Um, but hopefully you don't measure your pasture using those circles anyway. But so that, that is just a, um, they're, they're measuring the dry matter. So what was measured in this trial was dry matter production 
and then they looked at the metabolizable energy and improved protein content and all those other things of pasta, which as you can imagine wasn't very, very great in those. So all the individual crops on the 31st of July looked like that. And then they had a six-way mix of cowpeas, soybeans, turnip, radish, millet and sunflower on the 31st of July looked like that. And it just blew everybody's mind. Everyone who saw that, who came to that demonstration farm and saw, okay, so all our individual plots have failed and we put six species together and we've only had one inch of rain and it's grown like it was up this high. I mean, how can that possibly happen? And that's when the whole uh, era, I guess, of cocktail cropping, what was called cocktail cropping, it just became, it went viral in the United States and there were uh, websites and email threads and all everybody could talk about was cocktail cropping. We now call it multi-species multi-species covers or multi-species forages, depending on whether it's going to be for livestock production or whether it's going to be animal production, uh, livestock production or for cover crops. So another example of this phenomenon of this threshold I saw in Alberta, uh, in eastern Alberta in 2015 was a drought year. Um, and again, it was on a research station. They'd sown a monoculture triticale across a large paddock and then in one corner, the local producers had asked, can we please have a cocktail, cocktail crop here? Gabe Brown had been visiting the year before, and so they put in a mix of, uh, it had already been sown down to Triticale, and they just came back across it with oats, killage radish, sunflower, field peas, flavor beans, chickpeas, crozone millet, and foxtail millet. I realize a lot of these things don't grow here, um, but there's plenty of things that do grow here. So this is what the Triticale monoculture looked like in the drought. It had failed, there was no way it was going to go through the grain yield. And then over in the corner of the field, we have a room that's uh, a, a patch that was probably twice the size of this room uh, of the cocktail crop. And you can see the triticale in the cocktail crop. If for those of you who aren't familiar with triticale, oh, it's, doing that. it's a cereal, it's a cross between wheat and rye. So you can see the heads here on the triticale, and then in there there's sunflowers and radishes and uh, 12 other things. So there was no sort of sign of any moisture stress at all, where though all those extra plants had been sown across the top of the triticale. I mean, it's really amazing how can that happen? Um, it's just, just mind-blowing. Anyway, a little closer to home is the Jena Biodiversity Experiment in Eastern Germany. This has 20 by 20 metre plots of sometimes monocultures right through to, so there's two-way, four-way, eight-way, 16-way mixes all set out. Oh, if I could press the right button, it would help. <laughs> all set out in that design like that. There's been a lot of information collected from these plots in Germany, including everything from the insects that are in them, that's what these people are doing in this photograph, to the biomass, how much just the sheer weight of biomass is produced, and then looking in the soil at what happened with the nitrogen, what happened to the phosphorus, what happened to the minerals and trace elements, um, what happened to the carbon, and what kinds of microbes were living there in the soil. The Germans have done this extremely well and a huge amount of detail and we published hundreds of papers out of it. One of the findings was that plant diversity was more important than nitrogen in terms of biomass. So if you're a livestock producer and you're thinking about how much biomass you're producing, uh, they looked at one, two, four, eight, or 16 different kinds of plants growing together with not 100 or 200 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. And what they found was that if they had eight or 16 different kinds of plants in one of those 20 by 20 metre plots, it produced more biomass than having one or two kinds of plants in there, even with 200 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. So high diversity and no nitrogen produce more biomass than one or two different kinds of plants with 200 kilos of N per hectare per year. So if, if that, that N was, say, urea, for example, that 200 kilos is like 400 kilos of urea per hectare per year. And they produced a great little video, um, which I'll send the link out. I'll send it to Kevin or Sean and they'll send it out to you. Um, this is a screenshot from the video. It's only an eight minute video. It's just the main findings from the Yana experiment. And this one shows you the number of species along. Well, we'll show you in a minute. <laughs> I think. I can see it. 
I don't know whether I'm touching something here, but anyway, the number of species along the bottom, two, four, eight, or 16, and this is the biomass in weight up the side. So you can see this is a straight line relationship. The more different kinds of plants you put together, the more biomass you will produce. And some of those plants don't have to be high biomass plants. They can be things like, um, like flax, for example. I will put flax in every mix you possibly could. Uh, so it's not necessarily having great big things like sunflowers. Um, it's the number of species. Because some of their species were quite, things that they had in there were quite small herbs uh, in their mixes. They also found that soil carbon increased. Um, so the more different kinds of plants you had, the more carbon was in the soil. And that's because um, when they looked at the soil microbiome, they found you had a, a microbiome that functioned far more effectively when you had a diverse community. And it was just pulling down more carbon. Um, into the soil and then the microbes because there was a diversity of them forming humic polymers is quite a complex thing to do and the more diversity you have in the microbiome the more carbon that can actually be stabilised in the soil. Um, so the, these are screenshots from their video they're just we're talking about exudates coming out of the roots and the microbes that live around the roots. They also talked about the fact that on the left there you have just a two species mix so that could be ryegrass and clover for example will result in very shallow soil formation. So what I've seen in the very short time that I've had in Ireland so far is that with people with just ryegrass and clover pastures, which end up being mostly ryegrass, that when you dig down into the soil, um, you find that you're not getting good, good um, depth in that soil. And the one on the right is an eight species mix that is producing deeper soil and, um, and therefore more nutrition in the plants as well. But that deeper soil has other... If you were thinking about the fact that it rains every other day in Ireland, if you have deeper soil, then the moisture can get deeper. It's not going to sit just near the surface. So I guess that's the point I was trying to make. So what I'm seeing in ryegrass fields is that the water all sits near the surface and people are saying, oh, we couldn't possibly have our livestock out in winter um, because you know the soil is going to pug up and water sitting around on the top of the soil. If you actually have a deeper soil profile, the water can get down deeper and you won't have as much sitting near the soil surface and you won't have as much obvious pugging of the soils. And obviously having the root biomass is also going to help with the weight of animals. So what happened in this Yana experiment was that that river, the Yana River, flooded and they thought they'd lost the whole thing. So it sat under about a metre of water for several weeks. And this is in the video as well. And I thought, well, that's the end. That's the end of our trial. And what they found was that the high diversity plots, once the water drained away, were perfectly fine, and the monoculture plots have died. So it's another reason that high diversity, if you can get through that with high diversity, you can get through an Irish winter with high diversity. <laughs> How much time have I got? After quarter past 11. Okay. So I just want to show you one more example. Um, this one's from New Zealand. Jenny and Maya Smith are farming on ash soils. Um, it's a volcanic, um, a pumice soil. If any of you are familiar with what pumice looks like, it's also called pumice. When you send it off to the lab, it's got virtually nothing in it. Um, so people have been using just about every mineral and trace element that plants need in order to try and grow something in a pumice soil. The Smiths had had been doing that, been costing them a lot of money. They were dairy farmers, they weren't making any money out of dairy. They changed, um, I'm just giving you a short summary of this, they changed to a biospinner and they were able to produce, uh, I'm just going to turn this photo upside down, they were able to produce about six inches of topsoil using a biospinner. When I go back to this photo, you can see that their pasture really didn't look too bad. Um, and it's a ryegrass clover pasture. But I said, well, next step after using a biosimilar is that you need to go to diversity. So they put in a, just a trial two-acre plot of a high-diversity mix. So the cars that are down there um, mark the corner of the paddock. There's a fence runs up here, and the fence runs along here. The water trough is in the paddock, the sheep drop is in the paddock. And you can see that it's um, a very different scenario to the ryegrass. And we went in to have a look to see whether the red clover in there had nodulated and that's Maya with the spade, his wife Jenny next to him, Sun Taylor and Claire Bradley from Agassiz. So the biosimilar that they were using was a fermented seaweed product. When he dug a hole to have a look and see how the, uh, the red clover was going, 
he found that he had built that much topsoil from that. That's that's the same soil in that paddock, and he was didn't believe he actually didn't believe it. He thought he must. He said, "Oh, we must have burned a tree here." So he just put that back into the ground and went a metre away and dug another hole. It came up exactly the same as that, and then dug another hole, dug another hole, dug another hole, and took back the whole the entire paddock was like that. So he had built that much topsoil in five months. <laughs> He had already been using a biostimulant for three years, so there's been no nitrogen in that system. Um, but he has improved his soil hugely by going to a biodiverse mix. So just standing on that paddock and looking out across the rest of his farm, um, he's now in the process of converting all of that to a multi-species mix. And this photo was taken about six months later. You can see the cows are now up to their um, well, up to their bellies, really, in that grass. He's gone to a longer round, or in that multi-species mix. So he's on a 45-day round now. Um, in New Zealand, dairy farmers will not believe that you can put cows into high, into tall grass and have long rounds and still produce milk. He's producing 300 litres more milk every time the cows go into that paddock. That's his wife, Jenny, standing in that. That is a tall grass pasture or a tall herd pasture and that's Maya standing in his chicory where it's flowering. So they have improved everything in their soil, uh, which I'm gone over time so I really haven't got time to talk about this in any great detail. Um, but basically all of their nutrients have increased, their total organic carbon has doubled and their bricks levels have quadrupled. So bricks is going to tell you how fast those plants are photosynthesizing and how much carbon they're pushing down into the soil. The milk production has increased and their somatic cell count has gone down, their cow fertility has increased. Um, and this is just another photograph that came in the other day of another farmer in the north part of New Zealand. So they're uh, strip grazing their, their forages. But the important point to notice about this one is there are no grasses in there. So the trend is actually to go to a multi-species mix that doesn't have grasses in it. You're not going to be able to keep the grasses out over time you're going to end up with more grass and crops foot and other things coming back into those pastures anyway. So the plant diversity has been shown from scientific studies that have been published in international peer-reviewed journals that plant diversity improves animal nutrition, growth rates, milk production, conception rates, um, reduces dependence on vets, isn't in the scientific articles, but that's what farmers tell me, and it builds soils, there's plenty of science around that. So these diverse systems are self-organising the microbes know what to do. We just have to figure out how to manage for above and below ground diversity and the details will take care of themselves. So what here in Ireland, what you need to, to figure out, I mean, I'm seeing things growing on the roadsides um, that you may not necessarily think of as being pasture species, um, but you just basically, it's a matter of figuring out what will grow here. In Ireland, I've seen uh, vetches that just find out what will grow here and what, will, what you can put together as many different things as you possibly can that will grow together here in your pastures and just let the, what, just let the microbiome sort it out from there.